Amen. We want you to know today that, uh, that you are in the right place. And I believe that God is going to speak. And I believe he's going to say something so profound and powerful to us today in this season that is so incredibly important. And uh, the worship team earlier, how many know the spirit, the Bible says the spirit and the word agree together. They are one. And when the worship team was worshiping earlier, and uh, Karina, I know they're, they're, they're stepping off the platform, but she began to see, uh, shout, repent for the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something, that is like the cry of heaven that's tied to the word that I believe that God has called me to bring to you today. And so I want to jump right into this message today. And once in a while, I step over into Bible prophecy because of the times in which we live, it's not something we're just looking forward to, it's something we're actually progressing in already. And you have to understand the times that you live in. You have to understand and discern the time. The Bible says that the sons of the tribe of Issachar discerned the times that they were in and they knew what to do. As the church, we need to know what to do. This is not a rehearsal. This isn't a playground. It's a battleground. Do you hear what I'm saying to you today? This is a powerful, powerful time in the earth, and the Lord has assigned me to speak on a specific topic today related to end-time prophecy. He's been speaking to me over the past weeks and months about our current and our future position as a people in America. I have not been overly vocal about it from the pulpit because the Holy Spirit has not told me to be vocal about it. How many know we have to do what the Holy Spirit says? Not always what makes sense. But today, I feel like the Holy Spirit has released me to be vocal about some things. And we need to understand the times that we live in. About 30% of the Bible that you hold in your hand, about a, a third of that Bible is prophetic. And most of the prophecy that is in that third are, is prophecy about the end times. Prophecy about things that are to come. And you are living, listen closely, you are living in the most prophesied about time in human history. You are actually seeing and getting ready to see some things, things around you, some of the things that frustrate you, some of the things that, that you rant about on social media, you're missing the whole point that God is actually at work. And we think we're more in control than we really are. How many know he's God and we're not? Amen. Amen? And that means he is in control. He's not up in heaven worried, wringing his hands, frustrated about what's going on in the earth. He's not reacting in heaven. He's ruling in heaven. And so we did, in the beginning of last year, I did a series of messages as we kind of stepped into this time of, of uh, this pandemic began to grow and we step into this time of quarantine and we went completely online for a few months and I did a series of messages that I called Stranger Things. I kind of borrowed the title from that Netflix series because the things that we're in are Stranger Things and Stranger Things are coming. And I prophesied a year ago about Stranger Things coming that have come. I, I love to see when God speaks and then you get to see that word fulfilled. Sometimes he speaks and there's things that haven't been fulfilled yet. But when you begin to see things be fulfilled, I love being in a house that is prophetically accurate. I love being in a house that for 30 years has had a prophetic foundation where our prophets and people that are speaking the voice and the word of the Lord from this house don't always say what everybody else is saying. But the things that are so accurate for our times, it's very important. Don't underestimate the value of what God has connected you to. Don't underestimate the value of what God has connected you to. Because the enemy is going to try to pull you away from the very life stream that God has placed you in. And I believe 
the, the church and many people across this nation are having church today. I believe church on a bad day is still the best thing going. Amen? But I just want you to know that you're in a very valuable place that honors the voice of the Lord above other voices. That honors the strategy of the Holy Spirit above just other strategies in terms of the church. So there are stranger things happening all around us. So this is going to be my stranger things update for you today, January 2021. And I'm going to talk specifically about America. And I want to talk about this uh, in a way I'm titling it the state of the nation. And I want you to see this today from prophetic scripture. The wonderful news is Jesus warned us in advance of what was going to happen. He showed us the signs that would come in the world and he gave us clear understanding of what was to come. That means we need to be reading the words of Jesus. You need to read your Bible. It's important for us as believers not to get too fixed and focused on what is around us. We have to stay focused on what is above us. Keeping our eyes on things above, not on things of this earth. And I want to say something to you today, and it might be a little bit controversial, but I want to say something to you today about the recent election. God spoke to me before, the week before the election happened, the presidential election that we just walked through, and the whole transition of government. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord spoke to me. It's not the most popular thing. I haven't heard anybody else say this. But the Lord said the problem is believers, many believers and Christians begin to look to a man rather than to God. The Bible calls that idolatry. And even if a man is a likable man or a man that you think is the right man or the man that you think is good, if God's people make themselves for an idol and look to a man for their Savior instead of to God for the Savior, God will remove the man. That's enough about that. But I want to say that because we have to understand that God is in control. And as believers, we cannot look to a politic. I believe as believers we need righteousness exalts a nation. I believe we need to be careful. I believe we need to vote. I'm a patriot. I love peace. I love our country. I love these things. And that's all part of our responsibility on this earth. But as spiritual people, we have to keep our eyes above. Colossians 3.2 says, set your eyes on things above. Not on things of this earth. Set your eyes on things above. Not on things of this earth. So with that in mind, I want you to turn. Am I getting you a little nervous yet? I want you to go ahead and turn to Psalm 9. Turn to Psalm 9 and we're going to set the table for this message today. Psalm 9. Woo. Ooh, I'm excited. You know, sometimes I preach a lot, and it's always a privilege to get up and preach the word and carry the word of the Lord. But sometimes I get up, and it feels like the first time I preached because I'm just so excited and a little bit nervous because I feel like I'm delivering something that's so direct from heaven for where we are that really helps us a lot. And this is going to help you today, so stay with me. Stay with me. Psalm 9 in verse 7, God is in control. Hallelujah. Psalm 9 and verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. And he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. I want you to skip down to verse 17 for time's sake. Verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The wicked shall be turned into hell and look at this, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, and do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Selah, which means 
stop and consider what you just read. Close your eyes with me. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you, God, for just the honor, God, to carry your word and to preach your word and to bring your word to your people. Lord, I thank you, God. I don't want to ever take that for granted. And God, I just ask by your spirit that has already been set up in this place in the worship, Lord, by the, all the things we're anticipating this year and connecting to each other relationally in groups, Lord, the things that you've done in our, in our, our men and women in Freedom Week, it's all the things, God, that are stirring up in your house to get us ready. Lord, speak to us and give us clear direction today from your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the United States of America, every day when the sun rises over Washington, D.C., its first rays fall on the eastern side of that city's tallest structure, which is the 555-foot Washington Monument. The first part of that monument to reflect the rising sun every morning is the eastern side of its aluminum capstone, where these words are inscribed. Laos Deo which means praise be to God. This compact prayer, visible to the eyes of heaven alone, is tacit recognition of our nation's unique acknowledgement of praise to God. And I love that the very first rays of the sun that hit our nation's capital fall on those words, praise be to God. I love that about this country. From the very beginning, God has recognized and feared and sought and honored. Has been, he's been recognized, he's been feared, he's been sought after, he's been honored in America to an unparalleled degree in comparison to any other nation. For sure, this nation is flawed, as all nations are. But it has been uniquely favored by God, and I think there is no doubt that God's hand of providence has rested on us from our inception. His grace has brought promotion and progress and prosperity over two centuries of time. And I love this country deeply and we all should. We cherish the rich and the godly heritage that God has given to us here. And we are beneficiaries of a great legacy I have been had the privilege in the ministry that God has called me to, to travel across the world, over 50 different nations. And let me tell you, we live in a great one, even on its worst day. But it's tragically ironic that the nation whose first light falls on its capital, falls on the words, praise be to God, has now pushed God out of the national discourse. Praise be to God is the farthest thing from most people's minds in our nation. We've wis we witnessed this seismic shift in our country on every front. And we find ourselves spiraling down morally, politically, theologically, with increasing division and increasing despair on every side. The most succinctly I could say it today is that America is losing her soul. Things are not headed in the right direction. It feels like something ominous is on the horizon. Like I said over the past weeks, God has been speaking to me a couple of weeks ago. I had an unusual dream. and I'm going to share it with you today. Because God doesn't often speak to me through dreams, and I rarely even remember my dreams if I dream. They say you dream every night, but I don't remember it. But this particular night, I, in the dream, I was in the midst of these huge waves. It wasn't dark. It was bright, sunny. The, the, the water was beautiful blue water. It was in the ocean. I could see a rocky uh, horizon on a coast in the distance. And there were these massive waves that would come huge it would, and, and just push me back and forth as I was in these waves. And I was just there for a long time. And somehow, I don't know how, but somehow in, I knew in my dream that these waves were 11-foot waves. 11-foot waves, that's huge waves. 
And I'm like, I knew that they were 11 foot waves. I knew that they were very dangerous and they could kill me, but I wasn't afraid. And for some reason, I was staying afloat and just kind of swimming and enjoying the sun and the water, not really able to get anywhere. After some time, I, I found myself moving down the coast until I came to a calm area of water and I began to walk up and there was a beach area and there were hundreds of people. They were all in their swimwear, they were in sunglasses and umbrellas and they were standing, many of them were standing in the water kind of up to their knees, it was totally calm. It looked like a, a scene right out of a Caribbean paradise island somewhere and they were looking out to the horizon and waiting for something and I asked what are you waiting for and they're like oh there's there's these big waves that are coming in and we're waiting we're so excited we don't know what to expect but we're so excited we're looking and and we're watching for what's to come and I saw uh, a young man kind of in the distance and he's not here today so I'll just call his name it looked like our middle school pastor Jason Cox is that who it looked like and, and the person that looked, so I, I recognized, so I started trying to follow him. He would grab this, this young lady here and this young man here. And I was listening to him, and this is what he would say. He would say, you have to stay with me because the thing that the people are anticipating is going to destroy them, and they don't know it. So we have to save them before it's too late. And then I woke up for a moment, and then I found myself back in the dream again when I went back to sleep for like the rest of the night, it was just a long time, and I was back in these waves again. And I feel like yesterday morning, God gave me the interpretation for that dream. I woke up, I was praying yesterday morning, and I feel like that he gave me the interpretation. I shared this with my wife the day after I had the dream because it was so unusual. And she said, well, you know that 11 is the number in the Bible that represents judgment and chaos. And I said, I know, I know that. Actually, 11 has been a number that God has spoken to me through in the past. And so, so it was, it's interesting that I believe that those waves represent what the world is currently experiencing. But here is what's coming. There is coming a time where there will be calm and peace. And the Bible even says, they will say peace, peace, then sudden destruction. But it's important, and I don't think it's immediately. I think we still have some waves to go through for a while uh, it, as a culture, as a world, as a nation. But I believe there's going to become a time where things are going to calm down. And it's going to be easy for believers especially to relax. And I just speak to you prophetically today. I, I feel like that it's a time that it's easy for us to kind of put on the sunglasses and relax and kind of look out. But I believe that when we're there, that is the time that we have to take advantage of and see the urgency to preach the gospel like never before in the nations. And it's so amazing to understand what God is doing. And the Bible says when Jesus was talking about, and I'm off my notes, but just hang with me for a minute. When Jesus was talking about the signs of the end... He talked about how there would be times where his people would be in contention with each other. Matthew 24. He said the love of many would grow cold and many would be offended. Sound familiar? And he said, but the end is not yet. He said, but those who endure till the end will be saved. And then he says... My gospel will be preached to all nations and then the end will come. Let me tell you why I'm excited about a day where there's a lot of contention and problems. And people are leaving, dividing themselves from one another in a divided culture, in a divided place. Let me tell you why I'm still excited about that. I'm excited about that because when Jesus was giving the list of the signs that would come, the next thing that's going to come after the offense and the division is that the gospel will be preached in all the earth. So I believe that we are setting ourselves up. Amen. Come on. I believe we're setting ourselves up right now to see one of the greatest opportunities for global revival that we've ever seen. 
And we have to be ready and equipped, starting right here in our own city, in our own workplace, in our own. We have to be ready and equipped to preach, to do what God has called us to do, because the time is short. And I want you to hear this. I believe that this is what's coming, and I believe this is tied to the dream that I had. It's where a lot of people seem to be today, kind of we're walking around waiting for something, anticipating something, and we don't know what it is. We feel very secure in a lot of ways, too secure perhaps. We look back and we see America's distinguished past in ways we look around and see a distressing present, and then we look ahead to see a dark future. It can be discouraging if you only look at it horizontally. So we can't help but wonder as Christians, where are we headed as a nation? And I believe there's prophetic things to the world, and I know people you're watching in other nations, but I believe God dropped this word to me today specifically for this nation. For America, what does the future hold for this great country? Many people wonder, is America mentioned in the Bible? Does the Bible have anything to say about America's future? Is there any sure word of prophecy in the Bible about America? And I've always been, I've often been asked the question related to Bible prophecy, is America mentioned in prophecy? And, and I never get asked, where is France in Bible prophecy? I never get asked, where is Brazil or New Zealand? Or I was listening to a Bible prophecy conference. In fact, I was listening to a Bible prophecy conference a few days ago that was in Canada. And during a question and answer session, they asked, where is America in Bible prophecy? And so even in Canada, they're wondering, not where is Canada in Bible prophecy, but where is America? Right? Because what happens here, as it goes here, so it goes in the world. So I want to focus on this burning question today, does America have a place in prophecy? And let me say, along with many scholars, that I do believe America is alluded to in prophetic scripture, but it is not alluded to as a major influence. I want to say that. And I want you to understand where we're headed as a nation and why most people, even many Christians, have been foolish in their focus and their passion culturally. Primarily, they're most focused because they don't read the Bible or they don't pray and don't listen to the Holy Spirit. We have to shift our understanding as believers in Christ. You can't kind of be a Christian and kind of not be a Christian. It doesn't work that way. So today I pray you'll come to understand why Scripture is largely silent about America in the end times and what your focus has to be as believers. Let me start by saying this. America is not specifically or directly mentioned by name in Scripture. So the question is, is America symbolically or indirectly alluded to in some way? Are there end-time prophecies that include America? Some, some people believe that, well, America is part of the ten lost tribes of Israel. And I'll tell you right up front that ten tribes aren't lost. All right? They did. There's no lost tribes. Israel did get destroyed, the ten tribes in the divided kingdom. If you don't know the history of Israel, it's okay. You don't have to know that. But if you do, the ten tribes were carried away by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. But the members of the lost tribes, eventually, remnant of that came back along with the, Jew, the Judah, the southern kingdom from Babylon. In Luke chapter 2, you see Anna in the temple. She's from the tribe of Asher, which is one of the ten lost tribes. Also, when you go to Rome, Revelation 7, there's 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of the nations of Israel, including the 10 tribes. So the 10 tribes are not lost, which means America is not part of the 10 lost tribes. Just said that real quick. I know some of you are like, that just went way over my head. It's okay. Some people believe that America is this unnamed nation in Isaiah 18, a land of tall, smooth-skinned people whose territory is divided by rivers. But this prophecy is actually too... The Cushites, which were Ethiopia in the eastern region of Africa, which speaks to the East African people south of Egypt. It's not America. The eagle's wings in Daniel 7 is sometimes seen as a reference to America since the national symbol of America is the eagle. But Daniel 7.4 is actually a reference to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, which really doesn't directly have anything to do with America. But that's prophetic, and I'm not going to get into Daniel 7 today. Many people think that America symbolically is Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 because it's a place full of immorality and it's a world superpower. Babylon in Revelation is a place of power and wealth and affluence. 
She sells her goods. She sells her gold to the, to the world. She helps other nations become rich. And the Bible says she's ultimately destroyed in one hour while the other nations sit and watch the smoke of her burning. And although symbolically it mirrors a lot of things in our culture, Babylon there is referred to as a city. So it's not referring to a nation. It's not America. So where do we see America in prophetic scripture? Or more appropriately, the Americas, North and South America. And I want to show you real quickly where it is alluded to in one place in Ezekiel 38, where it mentions uh, the merchants of Tarshish. The merchants of Tarshish and the young lions thereof. This is a group of nations that rises up in the end times and is against the invasion of Israel. Tarshish was a Phoenician colony in Spain. The merchants of Tarshish actually refer to what we call the Iberian Peninsula, which includes Spain, it includes Portugal, and a lot of people believe it also includes the islands of Great Britain, this area. So the merchants of Tarshish were those who would come and who would go from this area of the world, and they colonized, guess where? The Americas, North and South America. So the young lions of Tarshish are the Americas, right? The, the, the merchants. So the Americans were largely discovered by Spain, colonized by Spain, Portugal, and England. So we are those young lions. So there are some areas where America is alluded to, and this part of the world may be alluded to, but you have to see this, that when we come into the end times, in the time of tribulation, America is no longer a global world influence. I want you to see this. In fact, it likely does not exist as we know it today at all. I know that's a difficult thing for many people to accept, but look around. We're already decaying as a nation. We're already eating away at ourselves like cancer, culturally, relationally, financially, morally, spiritually. I want to show you prophetically why this is important and why this is a very important message to us as the church, especially here in America. Because when you understand, and by the way, what I'm preaching to you today is not something I have heard preached. At least not much. There are some people that have alluded to these things. But, but by and large, this message, I believe, is something that the Holy Spirit has revealed and is revealing in the times that we live in prophetically. When you understand the scriptural silence about America, you also must recognize that something dramatic is ahead for us as a country, which will severely curtail the power and influence that we currently enjoy. But what will happen? I'm glad you asked. The Holy Spirit showed me what was going to happen to America in the days and years ahead. And scripture attests to it as well. And like we said at the beginning, the spirit and the word have to agree. So the U.S. will ultimately be replaced as a superpower by another superpower, a global leader called Antichrist. And probably will have a coalition of which America will be absorbed into. But regardless, America will one day not be the great superpower or leader of the world in the end times that it is today, but will become a follower. It is already happening. We've already shifted from leadership to followership, globally speaking. But we're shifting. Let me explain this. It goes back to the dream I had of the waves. Not the waves that we're in currently, the waves that I found myself in in the dream but the ones that the people were looking for that haven't come yet. You see, we have already turned the corner in America. And there is no turning back. America was built as the unsinkable Titanic. We push through, we, we war with each other, we do kind of things as though we feel like America is invincible and impenetrable. But America is the Titanic, and America has already struck the iceberg, and she will, in fact, sink. It's just a matter of when. 
This is why we have to change our focus as the people of God from what's around us to what is coming so that we can rescue this generation with the truth of the gospel while we have time. First, here's why it's going to happen and here's how it's going to happen. First and very obvious, there is a coming economic implosion in this country. There's no way out of it at this point. It will eventually catch up to us. We are looking at a $27 trillion national debt right now, which will continue to skyrocket. I can't even get my mind around how much money that is. But there is a debt bomb over us that's waiting to explode between decades of runaway spending and entitlements and economic stimulus money that we've needed during a crisis and poor budget management from government leaders, a massive economic crisis is looming over us. And when you read history, crushing debt is one of the factors that caused nations to die historically. Not to mention the biblical precepts of economic management that we've disregarded as a nation. We just disregarded all of it. We disregard the word of God and it puts us in a place where we think we're good but we're not good. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? It's important but that's why God also spoke to me at the beginning of this year that God just like the name Ephraim would make us fruitful in the land of our affliction. That God's people can still be fruitful even in a downward economic turn. So don't get scared. Well, unless you're not right with God, then you should be scared. Alexander Teitler was a Scottish history professor. David Donaldson from the the Scottish history here. Scottish history professor, professor who taught at the University of Edinburgh about the time of our original 13 colonies were making their new constitution. In 1787, he published a book, and I couldn't find it. I remembered hearing about this years ago. I couldn't find it. It was called The Fall of the Athenian Republic. It's talking about the Greeks and how the Greeks lost their power, and ultimately the Romans, and then Gibbons wrote his book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. But the Greeks were the inventors of democracy as we know it, as we use it. They were, they were the inventors of it. And from Teitler's book, I want to read the following quote that was written 200 and almost 250 years ago. I'm going to read it directly. A democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From, this was written 250 years ago. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by dictatorship. And we know in the end times who the dictator will be. He goes on to say, the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence. Listen, from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance. From abundance to complacency. From complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependence. And from dependence back into bondage. That was written almost 250 years ago. America as a nation already has strong indicators that we're nosediving toward the end of that list. Although some modern scholars that I read in relation to this writing say America is sitting between complacency and apathy on the list, statistics actually show that now more than 45% of Americans have reached governmental dependency. Not much longer, and we have bondage and dictatorship. Another potential hit that will come to the future of America will be continued global conflict 
and the reality of a cataclysmic, crippling terror attack, nuclear event, or national invasion. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Amen. Don't you feel encouraged today? Amen. Hang in there with me. It gets better in the end. You have to hear this, though. Nations and people groups have us in their sights already. We have an underground trade war already happening with China. It's not even hidden. They have ties with with Canada, I was talking about this before I came in here today. Unless you're blind, you have to see that these are real issues that we face. But we busy ourselves quarreling with each other over frivolous, foolish, superficial, unresolvable things. But people are afraid. Anxiety and panic is growing at a dramatic rate. The Bible also tells us that this will happen in the last days. That men's hearts will actually fail them for fear for looking after what's coming upon the earth. But likely the most troubling and difficult issue we face in the future of America is this. Worse than any outside force, worse than an economic disaster, is the moral collapse that will bring self-imposed judgment on us as a people. One man said, at the rate America is decaying morally, we should change our national symbol from an eagle to a vulture. It's absolutely staggering. We are seeing such moral rot in our nation. The sad thing is believers in the church not only participate in it, but condone it and sometimes ramp it up. Turning your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is getting ready to, to lay several chapters of this incredible epistle about God's plan of salvation and how his plan of salvation works for us and that we're adopted as sons and daughters and all of this. But before he gets into salvation and how all of it works, he lays out the condition of God's wrath against sin in a culture that turns its back on God. And you read that in the very first chapter of Romans. In Romans chapter 1, go down to verse 18, and it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Can we just stop there for a minute? The wrath of God gets revealed. In other words, it comes upon Men who are operating ungodly and unrighteous, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's talking about people who know the gospel. That's talking about church people. That we know the truth, but we hold it in unrighteousness. We know what we should be as a nation, but we go a different direction. We know what we should be as individuals, but we go a different direction. So Paul starts unfolding this wrath of God against sin, particularly on believers who suppress the truth of God and who promote unrighteousness above him. Now, when we think about God's wrath in the Bible, which we don't like to think about, and it's certainly not a very popular topic to preach about, amen, as Tim would say, a crowd favorite, the wrath of God. But you have to understand that there are different kinds of wrath in the Bible, one is God's direct wrath, where God pours out his wrath on the earth in events like Sodom and Gomorrah. Another is God's end time wrath, or what we will see poured out in the days to come in the great tribulation, Revelation chapter 16, or Revelation chapter 6 to 18. You see this, and the world has never seen that yet. A third kind of wrath, and what should be the most sobering for all of us, is eternal wrath. This will come upon those who reject God, who reject salvation, who don't find Jesus as their Savior, and their name will not be written in the Lamb's book of life. And they'll spend it by God when how I think and feel goes above how he thinks and feel in any area of my life. The third sign that God has given a nation over is the full acceptance and celebration of these things in the culture. We read that in verse 32, that the culture not only practices these things, but actually is open about it and celebrates it. Our culture has gone mad. In New York, when the abortion law was passed for late-term abortions, 
everybody in the whole legislative gallery stood up and <laughs> applauded. They applauded. Basically, what's being promoted is infanticide and the sanctioning and sanitizing and killing of children. It's chilling. But we live in a generation that has become so anesthetized to this that they're simply not moved by it. The Titanic, ladies and gentlemen, is sinking. When people begin to give hearty approval to gross sin, we've hit rock bottom. The tragedy in our culture is we've gone from acceptance of depravity to the approval of depravity to the applause of depravity. That's where we are. We are awash in moral filth. And there's active encouragement for other people to get involved. One commentator I read said the way the text reads in Romans chapter 1, Paul is saying that those who give approval to the things are actually worse than the people who are doing them. In other words, it's actually worse to sit on the sidelines and give approval and applause because you're opening the next generation to grow into even greater depravity. I've seen most all of this transition happen in my lifetime. It's happened in one generation. Most all of it in the last decade. It goes back to the book of Isaiah where it says, they call good evil and evil good. I mean, it's all upside down. We've run the table on these Roman one sins. If you, if you, if you saw that, that kind of the, the crazy Netflix series, Stranger Things, it talks about the, the part of the way that they go into the upside down. We're in the upside down. It doesn't mean God abandoned us. It's saying when you see these things, it's actually a sign that we've abandoned God. God hasn't gone anywhere. We're the ones that's moved. In 1857, British parliamentarian Thomas McCulley said this, 1857, so this is a good 150 years ago, close to it. He said, your republic in America will be as fearfully plundered and laid waste by barbarians in the 20th century as the Roman Empire was in the 5th century, with this difference. The Huns and Vandals who ravaged the Roman Empire came from the outside, but your huns and vandals will be engendered within your own country. It seems clear to me that the huns and the vandals are upon us. And a nation that we love so very much is hemorrhaging from a self-inflicted wound. There are many things that will play a role in America's future. But here is the key event. And this is the point that I want to get to in the message today. I believe it's going to be the nail in the coffin for America and possibly most of North and South America. And the event that I believe best explains the scriptural silence about America in the time of the tribulation. And that event is called the rapture of the church. The New Testament refers to it as a catching away. That there's going to come a time where the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. This event, it will happen maybe sooner than you think. In a moment, the Bible says, in a twinkling of an eye, it says, you won't even know it. There will be two men plowing. One will be taken, another left. Two will be in bed. One will be taken, and another left. The Lord Jesus is going to return and we will receive an immortal, imperishable, incorruptible body and a perfected spirit. Why is this so important in regards to America's future? Because over 10% of the people in America today, according to Barna, are actually genuine faith-filled believers in Jesus. Along with even more in Central and South America. That's just in the United States alone, that's over 30 million people that will disappear in a moment. Other nations are going to lose people as well, but not as, a many, not as many. If you go to the Middle East, if you go to Europe, if you go to the Far East, you're looking at 1% or less. That's believers. Imagine an event where Jesus comes and catches away his people. What happens when you lose 30 million people out of a culture versus when you lose 1%? It will cause an absolute final collapse. 
of a nation and people groups that will have to be assimilated into something else and it will allow the power to shift from the west back to the east. And then you will see all the things that the Bible prophesies will happen in those days come to pass. You see, other nations will be affected as well, but not like this one. There will be gaping voids left in every strata of society. Not a single believer will be left on American soil. Imagine that for a moment. Our country's soul, the remnant, is removed. And after everything else I mentioned, America will become a zombie-like entity wandering aimlessly toward an ultimate and inevitable fate. It's coming. The complete departure of Christians is not the only thing that will change. Everything will be altered after that mysterious departure. Government will be altered. Community will be altered. Military, schools, hospitals, universities, families, marriages, natural infrastructures, and on and on. There won't be a single pocket of society that remains unaffected. For all practical purposes, God will have left the building. In this scenario, America will become paralyzed and will officially no longer be a player in world affairs. A heavy blanket of darkness will fall on the entire nation. And in that moment, politics won't matter. Race won't matter. Culture won't matter. Theology won't matter. Nothing that you get all worked about up on social media will matter. The only thing that will matter in that moment is, do you know Jesus? It's the only thing that will matter. And by the way, it's the only thing that matters today. Well, Pastor Lynn, why aren't you saying something about this? Why aren't you saying something about this? Why don't you say something about this? I believe the church needs to be a voice in its culture. But here's why. I am too focused on something more important. If you want to argue, I'm not interested. If you want to know Jesus, I'm very interested. Because that's the only thing that's going to matter. Everything else that you're sitting in and that surrounds you will sink to the bottom of the abyss. It will be over. You have to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is your salvation. It is the only thing that matters. Just like Paul said, I beg you, I implore you, come to Jesus before it's too late. We have to know who God is. We have to bring this generation. And I believe when I had that dream a couple of weeks ago, and I saw that guy that looked like Jason, I believe it's because it represented the young generation. They are disconnected and disjointed from the things of God. We have to rescue them before the waves hit. It's All that matters. It's it. For decades, America feared world dictators, the Cold War, the nuclear threat, the deadly pathogens, Islamic terrorism, and all those, although those threats are real and viable, it will be Jesus' rapture of his bride out of a rebellious planet that will pull the pin and ignite final global pandemonium. And it will usher in the most unprecedented moment in human history. And you don't want to be here for that. You don't want to be left. This is what's ahead for us. The Lord showed it to me. He showed it to me in a dream. He spoke it to me. I literally spent from morning until 2 in the morning yesterday diving through this stuff. Seeking the face of God. Writing stuff. Rewriting stuff. God showed it, and Scripture testifies to it. How long will the Lord stretch this out? I'm not sure. But I do believe that the rapture of the church will be the final end of America as we currently know it. And although it will probably be assimilated into something, it may not cease to exist entirely. It will not be what you know today. But I believe, hmm, you can't... You can't miss them. You can't miss it and be left behind in the horrors of this world to pick up the pieces. 
You may ask, well, what will America do after the rapture? Will it die? Will it merge? Will it become part of this antichrist Western alliance that the Bible talks about? I don't know exactly. But I believe the economic collapse, the outside threats, the moral decay, and ultimately the rapture of the church will one day shift this great democracy to its end. And the superpower that will arise will be a man called the Antichrist. He will rise. He's likely alive on the earth today. Some thought he would rise out of America, but that's not what the Bible says. We've made lots of American leaders into the Antichrist. JFK was said to be the Antichrist. Ronald Wilson Reagan, each of his names had six letters, 666. They said he was the Antichrist. They said Bill Clinton was the Antichrist and Hillary was the false prophet said Obama was the Antichrist, certainly more than a few people have called Donald Trump the Antichrist. But let me tell you, it's like whoever you don't like, right? But the Antichrist is actually somebody that will be loved. He will be liked, he'll be celebrated by the world initially. And he won't come from here. So let me just share a few more thoughts and we're going to close. This is why America is so important today. This is why where we are is still very important. Because America is Israel's main defender. And Israel is God's people and will remain a nation until the end times. We know that from Bible prophecy. So I believe America must reign, remain until the end times. But those times are fast approaching. America is instrumental in the setup of a coming shift. And I believe God's hand is going to remain on us as long as we pray. As long as we carry the light of the gospel, as long as we finance, it's going to push until that time comes. And when it comes, everything will shift. Well, that scares me, Pastor Lynn. Well, if you know Jesus, you don't have to be scared. In fact, if you know Jesus, it's exciting. Because the Bible says when you see these things begin to come to pass, look, because your redemption is getting close. Lift up your head. You don't need to be afraid. But if you don't know Jesus today, you need to know him. And today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. So if we maintain the strength as the church in a nation who will humble themselves and pray, if we will, like, like Pastor Tim preached last week, was powerful, it, like, like, like we're the 40 days of prayer and fasting that we're in right now. Listen, if we continue our defense of Israel... If we continue as a church to seek the face of God, this nation can be sustained while we're here. If not, God will choose to defend Israel in another way. But for now, America is the way he's chosen to use. But America will one day fall. And we have, listen, we have already crossed the line. It's not about politics. It's about the nature of our, us as a people. The Titanic has struck the ice. The question is, how long do we have? I don't know, but the clock is ticking. So instead of getting caught up in all the earthly things, we need to be focused on the souls and the lives around us. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Don't rant and post and tell me why all this cultural minutia is so important. Because you're just rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. You're just redecorating the Titanic. I don't care what the decor looks like on a sinking ship. I just care about getting people to the lifeboats. Do you hear me? Let me tell you something. If you want to know where we headed as Jubilee, where is the vision of this house? It's about getting people to the lifeboats. Every time we reach out and we do a community outreach, every time we're talking about how we can be more unified, every time we're doing connect groups and we're meeting together relationally so we can grow, every time you come into a church service and hear the word of God and worship God together, every time we do a freedom weekend and we find the crowd, all of those things. Why? Because we're here to be a light in a world that is dark and to give hope. To something that is surely hopeless. Because America is sinking. So don't be so concerned with the crises around you. Be sure you're ready for his return. Go get as many other people as you can. Time is short. 
our places of prominence in a world power in the end times will be replaced by a revived Roman Empire of sorts and an Antichrist. This is the word of the Lord for us today. This is prophetic, it is scriptural, it is for you, and I believe this is the time for you to get a hold of God's word. In light of this pivotal year, it's a pivotal year, 2021 is a pivot. It's on the year of one. The spirit and the word are one, they agree. We have to be one as the people of God. So what can we do? How can we operate in this culture we live in today? Well, we can either run and retreat, We can collapse into despair and fear and worry about what might happen. We can condemn the culture and become critics of each other. We can become absorbed by the culture. That's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're compromising and applauding Romans 1 instead of walking away from it. We can fail and give up. I'm tired of swimming upstream, so I'm just going to go with the flow. So many ways we can respond or we can actively shine our light in darkness. Listen, don't be upset about the darkness. Don't curse the darkness. A lot of people sit back and complain and they curse the darkness. Stop it. Quit cursing the dark and light your candle. God has left us here to be change agents. The day of the casual Christian is over. It's time. You're either going to be the saints or the ain'ts. And I'm not talking about football team. You hear what I'm saying to you? It's a time. No longer can you drift alone. Hopefully that, 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 that no tough choices are going to have to be made. At this point in American history, any moral or spiritual progress and impartation will be won by faith and obedience. It'll be me having to inconvenience myself for the cause of the kingdom. Me having to put these things secondary to the purpose of the kingdom as primary. This is where God is taking us. This is where we have to be as a people. It doesn't mean we ignore everything else. We just have to get our priorities right. You see? So that we can help people see Jesus. The darker the night, the more important every light becomes. It's been said the world at its worst needs a church at its best. The world when it's at its worst needs God's people to be at our best. I'm going to read this verse and I promise you I'm I'm ending. I've gone a long time but I hope this is speaking into you today. Titus 2 says this. Verse 11, it says, you don't have to turn there. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed And purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Zealous for good things. Zealous for righteousness. Zealous for love. Zealous for hope. Zealous to speak into a world. This is where we're at. I want to stir up your zealousness. I'm not here to make you depressed. I'm here to stir you up. I'm here to tell you that you're in an urgent time and you are one of the most blessed people to be alive in this time to get to see what may be the greatest move of God in the history of this nation, possibly in the history of the world. If you're watching online from wherever you're watching, you're living in an incredible time. Turn your hearts to God. Turn your life to Jesus. Give it to him. Let him wash you. Let him show you your purpose in the day and time that you live in. In July of 1959, Queen Elizabeth was scheduled to visit the city of Chicago. Everything was being made ready in the city. All of the the, the streets were cleaned. The litter baskets were painted. The red carpet was ready to be rolled out for her. When they alerted the manager of the hotel where she was going to stay, the famous Drake Hotel, and asked him, what plans are you making for the queen's arrival? He said, we're making no plans for the queen. Our rooms are always ready for royalty. 
Here's my question for you. Is your life ready for royalty? The king is coming. And whether by death or by rapture, you will stand before him. Your life needs to be ready for royalty. And the only way to be ready is to know Jesus. Close your eyes with me right now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I've done my best to deliver this word to your people. God, I ask you would go right now to every seat in this room, to every person watching this online, to whoever is hearing this right now, and go to every heart. And stir us up, Lord, because we must be ready to meet you. Our lives have to be right with you, God. I'm not perfect, but I'm connected. Come on, somebody needs to hear that today. You don't have to be perfect. You just need to be connected. Jesus will take care of all the details. You just need to come to him. You just need a relationship with God. He died to pay for all of the stuff that you struggle with today. If you're listening, if you're watching online today, we're going to pray. And I believe God is going to move in a powerful way. If you're here in this auditorium at your seats, if you would just stand to your feet. I'm not going to take a long time. Just hang with me for just a couple of moments. But if you're here today and you're like, Pastor Lynn, my life is not right with God. I need to get my life right with God. Sometimes we just need to come to him and say, God, here it is. Come on, just be real today. We just got to come to Jesus. If you're here watching online and you're like, Pastor, my life's not right with God today. I'm calling you to just find a moment, find a spot right now because we're getting ready to pray. If I'm talking to you and you're here in this auditorium right now and you say, Pastor Lynn, I I don't know if I were to stand before God today what I would say. I I don't know if I'm where I need to be with Jesus, but I wanna know today, I, I need to get myself right. I need to shift some things. God has been speaking to me while you've been preaching. Whatever it is right now, if that's you, I wanna ask you to do something very bold. And I promise you, I'm not going to embarrass you. We just, I just want to pray for you. But I want to ask you to do something very bold. If that's you, I want you to step out of your seat. And I want you to come meet me right up here at the front of this auditorium. If you need to get your life right, come right now. Do not hesitate. Do not stop. Come right now. God is speaking to you today. Today, God is going to turn hearts. Today, God is going to shift things. He's going to set our feet on course today. Come on, if that's you, you need to come right now. If you're watching online, you can find a place right where you are. You can find a place right where you are. Just just get to a place where you can focus on the Lord today. And I believe that God is going to come and move. I believe that God is going to come and move. How many say, I have people in my life, my workplace, my family, my school, wherever it is, that need Jesus today? If that's you, keep your hand up. And and lift your other hand up beside it. Come on, it's not too late. If you need to come up front, come up front. If that, and I want you at your seats to just begin to pray. Come on, we're going to begin to pray right now for God to begin to move on the hearts. If you know their names, call their names out. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's somebody you work with. Maybe it's somebody, wherever it is today, God is calling you back to himself. He wants to shift some things. He wants to redo some things. If you need to come down to the front, come on down. It's perfectly fine. We're just going to pray. That's all we're going to do. And come on right now. While you're praying, I want everyone that's here up front, and I want those watching online right now to pray with me. Jesus, I come to you. Just pray that to him. Jesus, I come to you just like I am with all my stuff. God, I ask you to have mercy on my life. Lord, thank you for dying in my place to give me life. Thank you, Jesus, 
for washing me clean right now of everything and make me your son or your daughter. And God, I give you my life. Take it, it's yours. In Jesus' name. Now I want you, if you're up here, I want you to begin to pray your own words. If you're watching online and you prayed that with me, I want you to begin to pray your own words right now. Let your own words just begin to come out of your soul right now. Let it come out of your voice right now. Just tell God whatever you need to tell Him right now. He's listening to you. You don't have to say any special word. Just tell Him, God, I'm yours. I'm yours again. Maybe you said, I've prayed this prayer before. It's okay. Pray it again. Tell Him, I'm yours. Sometimes we have to come daily before the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy. The Bible says we can do that. We can come daily before his throne. Come on, Lord. We ask that you would get our lives right, that we would focus on you, God, that we would recognize, God, that you are setting things up for an end that we can't see. Today, Lord, we pray for our family members. We pray for our workplaces. We pray for schools. We pray for pray for places of influence, God, where we have, God. We pray over our city. We pray over our nation, God. We pray over the president. We pray over all of the governors, all of the Congress and, and Senate, God, that somehow, God, that you would sustain us, God. You would sustain us, oh God. You would sustain us, oh God. Repent. Come on, I heard Karina shout this early. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent today. Come on, turn back to God. Turn your hearts to Him today. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. He's coming for His church. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming for His church. Lord, we cry out to You today. We cry out to You today. We praise You today, Lord. Come on, just continue to pray with me. If you're at your seats, just continue to pray. Sometimes we got to intercede and stand in the gap. God is going to honor and sustain us as long as we're pressing into his face today. Come on, right now. Come on. Jesus.